Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everybody. Uh, for me it's in fact late at night. <clears throat> and I'm happy to be delivering this lecture to you, the first of the lectures for the EMG 250 course, covering the contents of week number one. Let me just say a few words about the course as a whole, just to refresh the memory of those who began uh, this course back in August, and uh, to introduce also those who are new to the course, um, to, its, uh, to its structure and to its, uh, to its content. <clears throat> This course as a whole is about literature, and particularly the genre of the short story. Arguably, this is an ancient genre. In folk literature, for example, most tales are presented as more or less short stories. In ancient times and cultures, we find something that might be called a short story. However, uh, and you'll all be familiar with such examples. However, in this course, the interest is in the modern short story. That is a literary art form developed in the 19th century, dealing mainly with structurally simple stories, telling of all kinds of human situations, concluding with a more or less lyrical image that transforms these situations into a form of momentary but deep understanding, very often self-understanding. We will in this course read stories from the 19th and 20th centuries, written in English or translated from other languages into English. We will read stories from Russia, France, Ireland, Argentina, Afghanistan, North America and other places. The main idea in presenting these works is that you as readers find ways to enjoy them, of course, but as students this enjoyment must involve study, reflection, analysis, interpretation and research, and a lot of writing. Uh, at the practical level, I expect from each one of you uh, full participation in this course. Now, I know participation in a, in a distance learning course, in a course taught through recorded lectures, Skype, emails, and so on, is different to participation in a, in a classroom. Um, <clears throat> but, so the way you're going to participate in this course is probably much more abstract than the way you would participate in a normal course. However, some things are similar. Uh, each week there will be a minimum of two readings. I've already uh, gone through this in the syllabus, and I hope everybody's read that syllabus by now, or will read it in the immediate future. Okay, so each week, a minimum of two readings. In addition to the literary texts, there may be theoretical, philosophical, and literary critical texts that you will be obliged to read. Uh, and it's required in this course that you read all of this material. As you will have seen from the syllabus, there are written activities that need to be submitted. And it is important that all these are done on time. Uh, just uh, as an example, at the end of this week, that is October the 22nd, you write an analysis of Chekhov's short story, Death of a Government Clerk. It will be just one paragraph, but uh, you know, I want you to work on it, I want you to think about it, I want you to focus on uh, the story, I want you to focus on a little bit of research that I'm going to present to you. Okay. And I want you to produce you know, a nice, detailed, and precise analysis at the end of the week. 
and submit it to me. So you'll be doing something like this every week. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as already mentioned in the syllabus, each week I will post the week's work, including a recorded lecture, PowerPoint presentation, and an instruction sheet uh, for the activities, as well as extra readings. So you'll find all this posted on Power Campus at the beginning of each week. Later, I may move over to Moodle. Uh, but first, I just want to get you know the course material established and get our communication established. Uh, I want you to note too that uh, the photo there are there are two lots of texts. There are texts from the textbook. I mean, short stories from the textbook, and there are short stories that I have copied in one way or other. These copied stories I've already posted up on Power Canvas. And I hope very much that you're in the process of reading them now. <clears throat> I expect that each one of you have, has already accessed these texts. Now, as you, as you will no doubt know, uh, some of you have written to me on this subject, there is some delay in the issuing of the main textbook for this course. Uh, the main textbook is by uh, Anne Charters, and it is called The Story and Its Writer, An Introduction to Short Fiction. Some of you may have this text. Uh, some may be waiting for it. Um, <clears throat> I'm assured that the library will issue these texts during the week. So watch out for that. I've sent instructions to the library that this text is to be issued for ENG 250. So uh, all things proceeding as they should, we will start work on that text next week, on that book next week. Okay. For the moment, we're going to read uh, a story that's up on Power Campus that's in the um, series of texts, copied texts, that I presented to you. It's by a Russian writer, Anton Chekhov, and it's called The Death of a Government Clerk. It's this that we're going to talk about today. Let me just stress uh, if, that we will not be reading the story by Guy de Maupassant, The Necklace, uh, listed uh, as required reading for week one of this course. We're not going to read this because it's in the it's in the textbook and you don't have the textbook yet. Never mind. Sometimes less is more. Now, um, let me let me go to module number one. And just say a little bit about it in general terms. <clears throat> the title for module number one is Theory and Practice of Narrative. Now, what does this mean? Um, let me start off by saying that what we're going to do in this module is look at the structure. We're going to read the stories, but I want you to pay particular attention to the structure of the story. That is the plot. What happens, when it happens, why it happens. The second thing we're going to look at is how the structure, if you like, not only structures a story, but maps on to human psychology, human life. So, um, the practice of narrative means we're going to look at the structure of narrative. The theory of narrative means we're going to look at how that narrative, that structure of narrative, creates certain kinds of effects and maps onto, let's say, human psychology. Now, the word narrative. The word narrative 
uh, refers to the fact that in a story, one thing happens after another. That's all. Uh, <clears throat> narrative, a narrative is a story that is told. Um, when we tell a story, we can say that we narrate the story. When we tell a story, we can say that we have related a narrative. When we talk about the story of a certain event, we can refer to the narrative of that event. Uh, at a philosophical level, a narrative is an order of language and thought that we oppose upon a state of affairs in the world. Uh, for example, uh, when we present our version of something that happened, let's say a robbery, uh, somebody robs a bank, we present our version of what we saw, assuming that we are witnesses. We're presenting a narrative. Um, and of course, if you are a detective involved in that uh, investigation, you'll notice that all witnesses present different narrative. Somebody sees this aspect of the crime, somebody doesn't see that aspect and sees something else. Okay? So it is an order of events, but it's not an absolute order. We're not doing mathematics here, we're not doing physics. <clears throat> Moreover, and this is where uh, now we're getting into the theory of narrative, um, <clears throat> In our lives, individually and collectively, uh, we can say that um, there is a narrative structure. Again, for example, I can say that when I say that I was born into this or that family or society, uh, when I say that I speak this or that language, and when I say that uh, at the age of five certain things happened to me, I went to school, I started school. When I say, when I was 13, I went to another school and I started to have these kinds of friends, these kinds of interests, and I started to see the world in a certain way, I'm recording a narrative of my life. I'm arranging the events of my life into a narrative. Okay. Now, narrative is not simply the recording of a series of events. It's also dramatic. We don't just tell our version of the robbery, for example, in a flat tone, giving equal value to each event. We dramatize it, arranging it in terms of beginning, middle, end, and most importantly, cause and effect. We might even use metaphor. For example, I might say that the leader of the robbers, you know, the one with the gun, had a strange black hat pulled over his face, which gave him the appearance of a fish. For example. Uh, <clears throat> and all of this is, of course, valid in a narrative, and it makes a narrative. Mm. Not all moments in the story are equal. Some are more equal than others, as they say. Now, when we talk about the structure of the narrative, we're talking about plot. We're talking about the plot. I want to focus in this, in week number one, on the plot. Okay, you'll be familiar with this term. Um, <clears throat> again, you know, plot is the sequence of events, the events in a story that are as they're related, plus um, some kind of causal connection between those events. Uh, I'm sure you'll be familiar with this term, plot. And <clears throat> I want you to refer, to go to the, go to the readings, the photocopies, you know, the, the readings that I have put up on Power Campus. I think there are about 30 pages, maybe five, seven or eight stories, something like that. On the front page, you'll see uh, a plot graph. And this plot graph, this is what I'm referring to here. Okay. Plot graph. 
Now, at the beginning, let me just go over this for a moment. At the beginning, we have exposition. That's the start of the story. Exposition, it kind of means explanation. A statement of things. Then, going up towards the peak of the triangle, we have what's called rising action. Rising action, so oh, sorry, let me go back to exposition. Exposition simply refers to, you know, it explains the, the scenario. It explains what's happening at the beginning of the story. Uh, rising action refers to a series of events that, perhaps very ordinary events, but events that somehow create tension, conflict, uh, arise, it could be just a, a rising nervousness, but take the plot in an upward movement, if we imagine it on a graph towards the climax. And the climax is the peak. That's when everything comes together. Okay? Um, the climax of, um, of a Hollywood movie might be when the, the good guy, you know, the detective or whoever, uh, the good guy or the good woman, uh, captures the, the criminal solves the problem, or solves the crime, or is vindicated. You know, it's, um, if you think of the film Beautiful Mind, uh, about a mathematician who was largely ignored by society, by his friends, by his colleagues, because he was seen to be simple-minded. Okay? So it's when he finally wins the Nobel Prize. Everybody knows that he's a genius. That's the climax of the film. Okay? And then... The film, the film normally doesn't end with the climax, or the story doesn't end with the climax. There is a downward movement, a relaxation of the tension, if you like, discharging of the tension, and that's known as the falling action. And then you have the end of the story. And you can call it the end, but um, there is a word we use in English, it's called the denouement the denouement of the story, it can be a little twist. You know? It's not just the end, it's normally you get some kind of twist. Uh, it's a French word. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me give you an example. I know it's an example that uh, I'm taking from uh, a story written by Italian writer Italo Calvino. Uh, in fact, we already looked at this story in the first class on August 24th in this, this semester. Now, let me just tell this story. A man rode on a train to the city centre. I'm adding a few bits and pieces. Okay, It's a simple story. A man rode on a train to the city centre. Whichever city we don't which city we don't know. He was nervous all the way. For some reason, he could not identify. On leaving the train station, that's arriving in the centre of the city, he bumped into a man with wild eyes. There were, there were no apologies. Buildings, posters, traffic lights and cars suddenly filled his mind. He walked faster to escape this noise. He couldn't. He couldn't escape it. Someone else bumped into him. He spun around. But instead of angrily accusing the other man, and telling him to watch where he was going, he spoke of how everything was wrong. People stopped. He waved his arms. He wanted to tell them what was on his mind. But he failed. He failed to speak his mind. When he opened his mouth, there were no words. There was only silence. And so, in the end, he, he went home. And in his room, at home, he was both sad and happy. He was sad because he had failed to speak his mind, but he was happy because something had changed. He now lived in the hope that he would one day see the world in that other way. The way 
um, that had struck him like lightning in the city square earlier that day. End of story. Now, <clears throat> let's look at this story in terms of the, the graph plot. The plot graph, I'm sorry. Uh, we look at the exposition. Oh, let's, uh, let's look at it in general terms. So there is an exposition. You know, the story starts slowly. The man's on the train. But there is some disturbance to his existence. Um, <clears throat> he's nervous. He bumps into people. He starts to see the world in a strange way. So this is what we call the rising action. Then the climax, this rising action, leads to the climax. The climax is... I would say the explosion that takes place in his mind where he sees the world uh, in what he thinks are terms of reality. He has for the first time in his life seen through all the various life forms that, that come to us uh, onto what we call reality. Whether that's possible or not, I, I don't know. Um, and this day he this, he stops people, he creates a scene, and this is, uh, this is what we can call the climax. He's waving his hands. However, as we said earlier, he, he fails. This is something like, and he walks away. He walks home, or he goes home. This is falling action. Then, when he's at home, well, then we learn what the story is about. Uh, the story is about the fact that he went through this humiliating, this d disturbing and eventually humiliating experience only in fact uh, to realize that he had seen something that was important for him. And now he lives in the hope that he will see the world in that way once again in the future. That's the ding. Okay? That's the twist that gives the story if you like its meaning. That's the last note of the melody that retrospectively or retroactively shapes how we understand the melody that we've been listening to up until this moment. So uh, let's just go through it to, uh, Piece by piece, yeah? category by category, beginning with exposition. So exposition is the setting of the scene. It's the train ride. It gives us, and it's the train ride into the city. It gives us a frame in which to understand the story. Rising action, nervousness, bumping into people. Climax, shouting seeing the world in a certain way, falling action, nobody listens, doesn't work, he goes home, and as I said, at home, uh, he begins to have a hope, a certain kind of hope for the future based on this very strange experience. Okay? Now, the thing is, most stories take this shape, and if you were asked to briefly summarise a story, this these categories, this plot structure, shapes what it is that you say. If somebody asks you what happened in that film, then you know, you'll start with the beginning, some tension, the climax, what happens at the end. Okay? It's a very simple thing. It's common sense, actually. But it's very important for us here because we're students, and it's also very important for me because when I ask you, when I ask you to summarize a story, and it's not always easy to summarize a story or a film or something that happens to you. you know, events don't always conform to the shape of plot, but we use plot to put some kind of order on them, keeping in mind, of course, that plot is not an absolute. Structure. There are things that don't belong to plot, things that are actually really important in a story, in life, elsewhere. Now, uh, so we can conclude by saying that the theory of narrative that we've just described um, is a model. 
or at least the narrative structure of this group, is a model. It's a form. It's a shape. Okay? And let's keep in mind that as soon as we start to talk about the kind of effects produced by this plot structure, the kind of knowledge produced by this plot structure, when we start to map this onto human psychology, then we're getting into a different kind of thing we're starting to interpret. When we say why the events of the plot give rise to each other, how they're interconnected, how one thing causes the other, then we're interpreting the story. So first, I want you to analyze the story. I want you to analyze it uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the plot graph, uh, and then I want you to actually interpret it saying why these things happen. And you're going to do this with the story by Anton. You're going to do this with all stories that we read, but this week you're going to do it with the story of um, by Anton Chekhov. Okay. Now, next week, let me just jump ahead for a moment. Next week we're going to read uh, a theoretical text called Where Do Stories Come From? by a philosopher by the name of Richard Kahn. Now this is going to take us more into a, 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 a theore more in a theoretical direction. Okay, So I want you to really get this uh, descriptive element right, bang on, so that, and you'll do this in the analysis that you're going to present on the 27th of October to me, by, uh, on Turnitin. Okay? And if you do that, when you do that, you know, you'll be in a really good position next week to read this rather more, rather complex uh, text by Richard Carney and then apply that to the literary texts that we read. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> so today, or well, this week, you're going to read Death of a Government Clerk by Anton Chekhov. Okay. Now, uh, I should say a few words about Anton Chekhov. Some of you may have already come across Anton Chekhov. You may know something about him. Uh, he was born in 1860 and died in 1904. He was Russian. He's one of Russia's foremost and most respected writers. He's also considered what they refer to as the father of the short story. He, along with a French man by the name of Guy de Maupassant, whose work we were supposed to be reading today, uh, is, is considered the father of the short story. Uh, meaning that he took this folk form, if you like, this traditional form, sometimes written and from a written culture, sometimes from an oral culture. Uh, he took this form that was popular in many peasant cultures uh, throughout Europe, Central Asia, Asia, other, other countries in the world, and turned it into a cosmopolitan art form. Yeah. An art form read by people who had, with a certain level of education, who lived in in the big cities of the world. Uh, he turned it into a form that became studied in universities and literature departments, became of interest to philosophers, sociologists, psychologists, for example. Uh, <clears throat> now he, uh, Chekhov was a doctor, he's a doctor of medicine, he studied medicine at university. He started writing short stories in order to support his rather large family. I mean, not not his own children, but his brothers and sisters and his parents. Uh, and he became so good at it, and he was recognized by certain publishers, that he was asked to, to continue to write these stories beyond the time when he graduated uh, with his degree in medicine. So uh, his main profession became that of a writer, although he also did practice medicine. Now, there are a few things we need to know about Chekhov. Uh, you may know that up until the 1917 revolution, the communist revolution in Russia, there was slavery in Russia. Most big landowners, and they owned enormous pieces of land, 
owned their workers. Their workers were slaves. They were, the word they used was serf, S-E-R-F. Chekhov's father was a serf. Chekhov's father was a slave who, whose owner gave him his freedom. Um, this was rather important for Chekhov. Um, although he went on to, to have a good education, not to become a, a well-known member of society, he went on to travel throughout Europe, to be known, you know, to have his works translated into languages other than Russian. Uh, although he, he became famous, one of the main driving forces in his life was to rid himself of the mentality of the slave and become something else. Let's call it a free person. A person with a free mind. Um, <clears throat> whatever that means. Okay. And we find this in his story. So it's just something that you need to keep in mind. Uh, as well as writing short stories, he used his medical qualifications and his medical skills both to treat people who otherwise couldn't afford a doctor and also to conduct investigation and research into the state of the health of certain members of society, certain sections of society, um, whose health otherwise didn't concern those who had political power, political and social power. So um, Chekhov was uh, um, <clears throat> he was a philanthropist. Is the word he was somebody who wanted to give back to society the kind of advantages that had come his way. Okay. <clears throat> now, he wrote many short stories. He wrote many, wrote many volumes of short stories over a rather long career. Sadly, he died rather young of tuberculosis, uh, lung disease. Now, the story of his we're going to read is called The Death of a Government Clerk. Basically what happens in that story, it's a very strange story. It's one of the reasons I chose it, but it's, it's, it's an illuminating story as well. It makes us think. And certain things it doesn't say, it's a story that operates as much on what it says, or, sorry, it's a story that operates as much on what it doesn't say as what it says. In fact, it's what it doesn't say that really pulls us to the text. In the story, there a young man of a rather lowly uh, clerical rank. You know, you know, he, he works in the civil service. It's, he's like he's not a banker. You, you know, he he works in an office. He's a kind of secretary uh, in the government service. Um, he goes to the opera. He's very happy. He's in a state of bliss, as the story says, and which means that he's extremely happy. Something happens, he sneezes, what it, what it is that comes out of his nose or his mouth goes on to the head of a man who's sitting in front of him. That man happens to be of very high rank in society. Um, the protagonist, that is the, the person at the centre of the story, tries to apologise and explain to this high-ranking officer the high-ranking officer acts very roughly and, and rudely and dismissively to him. He can't tolerate it. He goes home and he dies. That's the end of the story. It's a four-page story. So we need to think about what's going on in the story and what we do with the story. Uh, naturally, after reading it, you will ask yourself, what happened? Why did it happen? Uh, each of us, of course, will have our own way of understanding this. <clears throat> but because we're students, I want you to ask yourself what happens and why it happens in the following terms, the terms of the plot. Exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> be aware that it's not enough to just describe what happens. It's not enough to say exposition equals at the opera. 
Rising action equals the sneeze and subsequent apologies and rising anger. Uh, climax equals the horror of Chervyakov, that's the, 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 the guy at the center of the story. It's, uh, climax equals his destruction, denouement equals his death. Okay? It's not enough to say that. You have to, this is what you need to focus on, but you need to say more. You need to analyze and interpret the story. That is, you're asked to think about why and how these things happen. Um, both inside and outside the story, you need to read the story and say, well, these are the order of events. But at the same time, in order to, to deal with the story, you need to look outside the story. You need to look at uh, the history of Russia, the social, social structure of Russia in the 19th century. You may want to uh, look at uh, some aspects of Chekhov's lives. You may want to look at contemporary society. I mean, you, you don't need to go back to the past to explain a story like this. Uh, there is something of current relevance to this story. We read it and we understand it. We know what's going on. Um, and we could imagine, I think, what's going on in this story in terms of our own society, wherever we come from. Um, somebody of a lower rank in the society is treated unjustly. And as we know, injustice is unbearable. And this particular person succumbs to the injustice and has a mental breakdown, acts in ways that uh, are irregular or in this case, uh, you know, somehow ends his life. So <clears throat> you might want to think about uh, Chervyakov's uh, psychological fragility. You might want to think about the officer's insensitivity to such matters. You might want to think about social class. Um, keep in mind that a 19th century, 19th century Russia had a kind of a, a pyramid structured society with the Tsar on top. Next down you had the aristocracy and the nobility, the other people who owned large pieces of land and also owned slaves. Below that again, but also tied in with the aristocracy, you had the military and the officer class uh, had immense political and economic power. In Russia you had the bureaucrats, that is the people who ran the civil service, people who ran the ministries, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Finance, Foreign Affairs, uh, and, and so on. Down to the bottom, where you had slaves. Our man, uh, Chervyakov, the clerk, seems to be in the middle, but on the bottom part of the middle. He's a literate person, he can read it right, he goes to operas, he functions in the city. Uh, as a citizen in that city, but he has no power, he has no influence, and he's subject, as we see, to injustice. <clears throat> now, let me just repeat, you are asked to, to think inside the story and outside the story, but in your analysis, in your interpretation, you must always cite your evidence, yeah? You know, what just what is it about the story that justifies you in saying this? Okay. Now, um, I want to read something that Chekhov wrote that may be of some help in understanding the story, and I've posted this uh, on Palm Campus. Chekhov uh, in a letter to another writer, another writer who wanted to write a story about Chekhov, said the following. He said, if you want to write a story about me, you have to include the following. Or the story has to be about the following person, which is Chekhov. A young man, quote, a young man, the son of a serf, a one-time shop assistant, choir boy, schoolboy, and university student, brought up to fawn on rank, kiss the hands of priests, 
except without questioning other people's ideas, expresses gratitude for every morsel of bread he eats, a young man who has been frequently whipped, who goes to give lessons without galoshes, engages in street fights, tortures animals, loves to go to his rich relations for dinner, behaves hypocritically towards God and man without the lightest ex slightest excuse, but only because he is conscious of his own worthlessness. He says, Chekhov says, could you write a story of how this young man squeezes the slave out of himself, drop by drop, and how on waking up one morning, he feels that the blood coursing through his veins is real blood and not the blood of a slave, unquote. Chekhov wrote that in 1889. Now, <clears throat> you might want to, as I say, you can read that on Power Campus. In the, in the PowerPoint. You may want to somehow use this as a secondary text, use this as your reference, uh, use it to inform your analysis of the story. The writer of the story has an interest in the kind of injustices that result from excessive power that one person holds over another person in society. Now, let's go to the analysis. And again, uh, these details are up on Power Campus. Your analysis is not just a dry academic analysis. I want you to pretend. I want you to write one paragraph. I want you to pretend that you are a detective or a psychiatrist, or a philosopher, or some other such figure, a journalist, and that you're trying, that you're writing a report uh, on the causes of the death of this young man. And the only evidence you have is the story and your own understanding of human psychology, your own understanding of Russia in the 19th century, your understanding of Chekhov's psychology uh, based on the, the paragraph we just read. Okay. Uh, you'll, write, you'll write a report. So I want you to think about it. I want you to analyse the story in terms of the plot. And then I want you to say why this young man died. Okay. Um, Now, I just want to, I just want to, by way of ending, I, I want to look forward to next week's class, yeah? Uh, and I want, but I want to do this in, well, next week we're also going to be reading Chekhov, another story, The Lady with the Little Dog. Chekhov transformed himself from slave to non-slave, whatever that means. The young man, the clerk, wasn't able to transform himself. He succumbed to the psychology of the slave and he paid the ultimate price for the injustice of the other, of those who have the power. Now, there are various ways in which, of course, the person can transform their life uh, in such a way, but uh, we, we're not doing history here, but we need to focus on the fact that Chekhov used literature to make that transition in his life, that transformation. He used literature, the act of writing and an interest in literature, if you like, to liberate himself and to transform himself. And so we've got more than, in the story, we've got more than a moral fable. Once we start thinking about the importance of literature in the life of the author, we have more than a moral fable. You know, this is injustice, injustice is bad. No. Um, there is something in literature that is uh, transformative, that transforms the world, the world of individuals, uh, collective world. Uh, I want you to just hold that thought and we'll come to it next week. In the meantime, go to Power Campus, find the instructions for the analysis, they're there. I've put everything under 
uh, you know, you'll see the categories of our campus. But everything's designated week one. Okay, lecture, week one. Instructions for analysis, week one. So uh, for next week, I want you to read For next week, I want you to read uh, Anton Chekhov, The Lady with the Little Dog, Guy de Maupassant, A Story Called Vendetta, and uh, the essay by Richard Kearney called Where Do Stories Come From? I wish you all the best. Please communicate with me if you have any questions, or even if you don't have any questions, preferably by email. Okay? Let's hope this works out. Let's make it work out. All the best. Goodbye from New Zealand.